when you bootstrap, it forces yeah. you to be really, really creative and think about each and every dollar that you spend and be super mindful and thoughtful about how you spend your money and where you spend it. And I think it just makes you a, a much stronger, uh, more empathetic, uh, sort of leader, right? You know, when, when you've had to fight uphill battles, when you've had to, how the hell am I going to make payroll? I think it builds character. I think it just makes you a much stronger entrepreneur. You're listening to the e-commerce influence podcast with Austin Bronner and Andrew Foxwell. If you want honest, transparent, and tangible results that deliver lasting value and revenue, this All is right, your podcast. It's safe to say that most of us have been doing a lot more shopping online lately. And if you're an e-commerce brand, that means you might be seeing more first-time customers. Once they've made that first purchase, how do you keep them coming back? That's what Klaviyo is for. Klaviyo is the ultimate marketing platform for e-commerce brands. Klaviyo gives you the tools to build your contact list, to send memorable emails, automate those key messages, and more. A lot more. That's why more than 40,000 e-commerce brands like Chubby's, 8sleep, and Living Proof, including most of my clients, use Klaviyo to build a loyal following. Strong customer relationships mean more repeat sales, enthusiastic word of mouth, and less depending on expensive third-party ads. Whether you're launching a new business or taking your brand to the next level, Klaviyo can help you get growing faster. Plus, it's free to get started. Just visit Klaviyo.com slash influence to create your free account today. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash influence. With SMS quickly becoming the most important marketing channel of the decade, many e-commerce brands are excited to get their piece of the pie. But with so many SMS tools popping up, it's hard to know which tool is the best fit for your growing brand. Postscript is a leading SMS marketing platform, laser focused on one thing building the best SMS platform for e-commerce brands on Shopify. Using Postscript, your team can grow a TCPA compliant subscriber list, use your Shopify data to create targeted text messages, campaigns, and automations, have two-way conversations with customers, and unlock a brand new marketing channel that drives big time ROI for your store. Postscript is trusted by thousands of growing Shopify and Shopify Plus stores to manage their SMS marketing. Stop treating SMS like email, and instead, respect the inbox, create hyper-segmented campaigns using your data, and make your customers happy. Start your free 30-day trial of Postscript today at ecommerceinfluence.com slash Postscript. That's ecommerceinfluence.com slash P-O-S-T-S-C-R-I-P-T. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Ecommerce Influence Podcast. My name is Austin Bronner. And I'm excited to be with you today. Uh, I've got a great episode for you. Great episode with a very talented, very sharp entrepreneur. His name is Calvin Coilis. And Calvin is the founder of Scotch Porter. Uh, Scotch Porter is a men's grooming company that has grown into something much larger than that. Really a wellness lifestyle business. Uh, and he has a powerful mission. Um, he's been growing this business for over five years and it's turned into kind of a powerhouse in the men's grooming space. They have contracts with Walmart, Target. He was recently named Entrepreneur of the Year for the state of New Jersey. And we have a fun, uh, informative interview. We talk a lot about some of the struggles he's had during his journey, what's been challenging, some of the success they've had, what's worked for them and cover a lot more. So uh, if you are on your entrepreneurial journey, this is going to be an episode I think will connect with you. Let's welcome Calvin to the show. Thank you for having me. I like to go down the rabbit hole to prepare for episodes. Uh, and I read something from out of an interview a few years ago, and it was asking you where your top place to, that you wanted to go in the world was. You said the Bazaruto Archipelago. Yes. Did you, did you end up going? I have not. It, it is still on my bucket list. I have not, but I'd love to go. I wanted to talk to you. I've been there. I just went there with my oh, wife. Really? Yeah. I, it stood out to me because that's been the most memorable trip we've ever taken. Really? You, 
You'll have to share. <laughs> You'll have to share. Wow. The reason it stood out to me is because it's such a unique, like, random spot for you to put it on that interview. <laughs> and it is. my uh, my wife and I went there about seven years ago, and we were on a little boat, like a little sailboat. And yeah. we sailed around for about 10 days uh, and camped, and it was – Mozambique was the most incredible place I've ever been. I am jealous. You got to make it happen. Now, it, now there's even more reason to go. <laughs> Absolutely. Please do share, uh, share some photos. Wow. <laughs> I, I will. But yeah, that's, that's, awesome. that's super. That, that's, uh, I was hoping you you'd said you'd been over there. and uh, <laughs> No. <laughs> I know you've been busy, man. You've been busy building a big ass company. Yeah. So. First off, congratulations. I know Thank we're you. recording this. You were selected as Entrepreneur of the Year for New Jersey, um, which is kind of a, just a, a, like a public sign of some of the success that you guys have had. How did that feel? Uh, it, it, was, it was amazing. Um, I'm usually a pretty optimistic guy, but I was up against, I, I felt like some, some much larger companies. And so I was very, very surprised. But the judges saw something, right? And um, yeah, I was very surprised, a little emotional, um, but it, but I'm really, really honored to have won it. And, and I was up against some really great companies. So it felt really good. For the listeners who don't know as much about Scott's Porter, how long, when did you actually get started? Like how long have you been, been running the business? So Scott's Porter has existed for five years. Uh, the business started in 2015, just a quick sort of, origin story on the brand. My story really starts. My mom had owned a beauty parlor and barbershop when I was a kid. And um, my brother and I spent tons of time in my mom's shop. And some of the most memorable experiences from that time was watching folks come into the shop, pretty intuitive kid in that somehow I'd notice that some of them didn't necessarily feel their best or, or walk in looking or feeling their best. They'd sit in my mom's chair, one of the other barbers and stylists chair, be transformed get up, look in the mirror, pop the collar, walk out with an entirely new step. Um, so that stuck with me, resonated with me, went off to college, uh, like most college students broke, <laughs> really, really broke. Um, super frustrated, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life and somehow thought that I should have had that all figured out by uh, my junior, senior year. Uh, that didn't quite happen. And so kind of felt like a loser at times. <laughs> But I do recall on some of those uh, most stressful weeks, uh, taking the last twenty dollars I had in my pocket, getting a haircut, and walking out of the barbershop shop feeling like a million bucks. So through my own personal experiences and uh, in my mom's shop and my own personal experiences uh, grooming, I uh, knew that grooming self care had the ability to help one feel better about themselves. Uh, Post college had gotten uh, pretty decent jobs, I'd say for a twenty something year old, pretty high paying jobs. Um, the last job was working in finance at a market research firm. Uh, sit, the thought of spending the rest of my life behind an office cubicle crunching uh, numbers just felt honestly like a death sentence. Um, so I'd say that that probably wasn't the I didn't enjoy that time period um, sure. and kind of felt like a loser, even though I was making money. Um, uh, one particular day, it was a terrible, terrible day, just felt like I was wasting my life away. Um, had left uh, work, had gotten on the train, had stopped off at um, the sort of the connecting stop. I don't know what it was, but I, but I looked across the street, noticed this brownstone building, had an epiphany from my time in my mom's shop and my own experiences with barbershops and said, I'm going to open up a barbershop sort of on the side. And about six months later, opened up a barbershop, noticed a recurring issue that many of those customers had, um, very dry, frizzy damage here and beards. Uh, went home because, again, bored with the daytime desk job, began to learn everything that I could about uh, natural ingredients and, and here and, and how I could utilize some of those ingredients to solve the issues our customers had. And that is how Scotch Porter was born. We started with about two products. We now have about 17 products and we have about five or six additional products uh, that we're launching now that we're launching in a couple of months. We started off as a D2C business. Um, and we've recently launched with two pretty well-known retailers, Target and Walmart, uh, in March of this year. Decently well-known. 
Decently well known. Yes. <laughs> Those are the big ones. That's uh, that's awesome. It's a really really good good story. I think one of the things that stands out on your um, your website is mm-hmm. how good of a job you do in educating. Mm-hmm. And you know you you can go there and watch videos, seeing how to use the products and like why you might need them. As you launched your first couple of products, what was your goal or mission and, and, and how has it evolved to what it's like today? Yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, when I first started out, you know, looking back, it, it was really it, it was always about a feel a feeling. I'm a pretty emotional guy. And the reason that I even opened up the barbershop was because of this feeling of sort of inadequacy, um, not necessarily feeling good about the career decision that I had made, uh, despite the, despite I was making, I was making decent money for, for a 20 something year old. Sure. Um, and so I decided to open up the barbershop based on sort of uh, just recollecting how well I felt or how good I felt in my mom's shop and how they made people feel good, you know, and decided to open up this, this barbershop and sort of kind of take this, this leap of faith because <laughs> eventually I ended up quitting the quitting the daytime job to just focus all in on Scotch Porter. Um, but it really started off with like this wanting to feel better, wanting to be able to help people to feel better. And I'd say that it it started out that way. It's still true today. You know, we've just put we've just we've just solidified a mission behind it, right? So our mission today is to help men to look and feel their best, to live their best, most fulfilled life. You know, but it, but as I look back, it's always been about helping men to to look and feel their best. You know, so I'd say that it it, it hasn't evolved much. Um, it hasn't evolved much. I think the expressions um, and the things that we do, such as you know uh, meditation moments and and all this wonderful content that we put to put together, we now have the ability to live that out a little bit louder than we, than we could before because of, you know, just, just financial constraints, right. As a new brand. Um, but so I'd say that it, it's always been to help men look and feel the best. It- sure. Well, you talk about resources and having more resources to deploy. I mean, you guys have emails that go out and talk about certain aspects of wellness and grooming. Was that something that you had in mind all along? Yeah, I, I think it developed over time. I'd say the first year that we were in business, it was kind of a test. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure that this was going to uh, lead to something uh, other than a hobby, right? It, it initially started off sort of as a hobby. I had no clue that this was going to be a business. Yeah. Um, and then when I realized that this possibly could be a business because we're, we're able to reach people, people are loving the products, you know, you know, folks are commenting, you know, how well they feel about themselves. I realized that we have a much bigger opportunity here. And I think at that time, I took a step back and, uh, you know, did some sort of, you know, did the kind of work that you usually hear folks say is important. So which is like things like, putting together, you know, a mission statement, thinking about the values of the company, you know, where's the company going to be in 10 years. I started to do sort of that foundational work. Um, once I realized that this thing is, could be a real business and not just a hobby. And from those exercises, we landed on what was really important, sort of the inspiration for the business, why I got started. And it was to help men feel their best. That like it was it was it was just those few words, and I think that exercise uh, and the time that we spent on doing that was is, is is so important to sort of where we are now because it allowed us to not be super general. So it allowed for like this you've heard big hairy audacious goal, right? Yeah. It allowed for us to think uh, not just sort of generally speaking, but what could this business mean uh, for folks outside of uh, just grooming products? And I think that's kind of where we, where we, where we, where we landed, right? It's like, why are we doing this, right? Grooming products are not just about, you know, it's not just about the practice of like having a great looking beard or, you know, putting, putting some products in your hair to have like great looking shiny hair or quaff hair or, um, amazing skin. 
it's really delivering hope in the bottle. It, and it, it really is about helping people to feel better, right? That's, that's fundamentally what personal care and grooming products are about. And so that entire exercise, even today, allows us to think about how do we continue to deliver even more value to our customers. And it doesn't put us in a box. It doesn't put us in the, we sell, we sell here, face, beard care, possibly body care products. It allows us to expand uh, beyond uh, just personal care products. So it was, it, it was sort of a uh, it was something that we did early on. It has allowed us to evolve. What's been the hardest part about building Scotch Porter? Wow. I would say it's been a couple of things. One, it's it's been figuring out how to continue to finance the company as a bootstrap. We were a bootstrap company. We're no longer bootstrap. So it's always been figuring out how to finance the company. Um, we also got in the sort of arduous operational um, sort of field of like developing our own products and manufacturing our own products and fulfilling our own products and marketing and just doing everything and managing, you know, everything from marketing to operations to sales has been initially, it, it, it was a struggle, right? And managing a team of, you know, dealing with creatives to dealing with marketing folks to dealing with folks that are not creative at all and they just make your product kind of managing that all has been has been quite the struggle but i think the one thing that has uh helped us successfully navigate all these different areas is just being a really good problem solver and actually it's it's one of the things that i look for when i'm thinking about bringing on a new uh a new teammate or a member to the team like they just have to be really good problem solvers and have um, entrepreneurial spirit and grit, because that's the only way to sort of survive um, here at here at Scotch Border. What What does the team look like now? What give us kind of a snapshot of of where you guys are at internally? We have a team of about seven folk, and then we work with a handful of consultants. So we work from consultants that help with uh, managing our retail sales. We work with a uh, controller consultant. We work with uh, production folks and product development consultants down to uh, creative and design consultants. So we work with, I'd say, probably about 10 to 12 consultants. And then internally, it's about six or seven of us. What's one thing you wish you'd known before getting involved with some of these big players like Target and Walmart uh, on the retail side? Yeah, I mean, we we literally launched in March, and so we've been in retail for just about six or seven months or so. Um, so I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure there's much more to learn about working with a retailer. But the one thing that's kind of caught me off guard in working with um you know these two large retailers is the amount of inventory that is required and planning and product development schedules. Right, as a direct to consumer company, we've We've had the privilege of always being able to, to come up with ideas on the fly, even product ideas on the fly, and sort of develop those products, uh, launch them fairly quickly on our site, you know, and kind of test them out and be able to see how they do. With retail, that is not that is not that is not going to happen. <laughs> and you actually have to have like six months worth of inventory sort of in, in advance, sort of predicting or projecting what your sales are going to look like at retail. Um, they, you know, you're also shipping product very early for their planogram resets, what they call them. Um, and so kind of doing things on the fly, <laughs> you know, that ability that you had, to, sure. had to, to do that in D to C, you can't really do that at retail at all. It's the, it's the quickest way to, uh, to not be in the retail space. When you can't deliver. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you um, did you get a chance to go to like Walmart headquarters or anything down there? I did. I, I had the opportunity to go to Walmart and Target headquarters. So I read a book a long time ago about mm -hmm. about sales, and they talked about the Walmart like selling to Walmart that it was the most interesting slash like demoralizing process uh, because the way that they had, and this may not be true, but he was like the way that they set up their offices, it's to like deliberately designed to help people, to help them grind down people on their prices. Mm -hmm. with it, 
did, did that make any did that make any sense? Like when you were what is it like at the Walmart headquarters? The only thing I'd say is, um, you know, I, I haven't had the opportunity to walk around the entire uh, campus. Our meeting was with the buyer. You know, the buyer had plenty of other meetings. We kind of sat in a, a lounge or waiting area for our turn. And then uh, it was myself, our senior brand director. And then we had our distributor in the room um, along with the buyer. The room was uh, it's a small conference room. They are, you know, they're definitely looking out for how they can deliver value to their consumers. Sure. I mean, we came in knowing that, you know, Scotch Porter is a brand isn't, you know, we aren't a super premium brand, but we are also aren't, you know, say like a $5 uh, and below kind of brand. So it was quite clear to the buyer, you know, when bringing us in and interested in Scotch Porter, you know, that they're, they're talking to a brand that would be probably um, premium amongst their existing set. But sure. I, but I'd say that we you know, over the years, we've built the business. I mean, before we even went to Walmart, we were in business for four years. So we we built the business as a D2C brand, uh, had built a loyal base of of customers who were purchasing our products. And I think they've seen the value in that, you know? It, it gives you a, a lot more leverage to it. Sound, I mean, because you've got your own thing going, right? Yes. Like rather than like going in there with hopes and dreams that they'll pick you up uh, because you got no other way to, to sell. That, that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing yeah. uh, that, that story of, uh, it's awesome that you guys have, have kind of made the transition. I'm interested to see how that goes over the next couple of years. When you look at your journey over the last five, six years with Scotch Porter, what, what's one thing that you have failed at or uh, a, a really, really tough challenge you've gone through? Gosh, I failed at a ton of things. Um, I'd say one of uh, one of the things that you know, sort of looking back on, you know, now that I wish I would have uh, sort of approached differently is kind of, you know, we all we all deal with, you know, imposter syndrome. <laughs> like we all we all, you know, some yeah. kind, some some ways feel like we're not we're not good enough, we're not adequate enough. You know, someone out there is smarter or stronger and, um, you know, better than us in, you know, in, in many areas. And, and, and now that I look back at it, I think that's one of the, I think that's one of the biggest failures for me in the past is kind of not believing that I had with what, what's needed, you know what I mean? To be able to push this company forward and not being as forgiving, right? And understanding that, entrepreneurship is a journey. It is a process. No one has all the answers in the beginning and you kind of have to fail. You kind of have to fall down and scrape your knees and get a little cut, you know, a few cuts and bruises along the way. Yeah. Um, and honestly, it, it, it truly is the only way that you can succeed. You got, you got to fall. You got to, you got to, you know, you got to get cuts and scrapes along the way. And I wish, you know, I wish that I would have given myself the permission to do that a lot more and not beat myself up so much. I think that that's something that so many people feel the exact mm -hmm. same way. And it's, it, yeah. it's crazy because you guys have had, you've had so much success. I mean, did you guys ever, did you ever imagine you'd be featured in Playboy magazine when you were growing up? <laughs> no, no way at all. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> there, is, there is no way that you could have told me that we'd be in Playboy magazine. No, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> oh, how, uh, how, yeah, how, how did that feel when you, did, how did that happen? Did they reach out? Like, what was the, what was the process for that? Yeah, no, they, they did reach out. They reached out to us and it was interesting. It was a, it was a length, it, it, it felt like a lengthy process, but listen, it's Playboy. It's an organization that's been around for a while and not everybody is nimble <laughs> like us startups. Um, you know, so they just, they told us that they were interested. We had, you know, a couple of discussions, you know, we talked about, uh, they talked about what they're, uh, you know, what they're trying to do in terms of building out an e-com business, um, how they'd like to feature us, how they'd like to place our products on their site for sale. And so it was, it was, it was an interesting experience and it, it, it was a, it, it felt like a very lengthy process though. <laughs> you mentioned this earlier that you're like, it was kind of like a hobby not just like a side thing. You didn't know if it was going to be a real business. When did you know that it was going to be uh, like had some true legs? I'd say a year, 
a year after we launched, you know, the first six months we, we launched the product in our barbershop and, you know, we, we did have word did spread and we had people coming in from you know places. Our barbershop at the time was in Newark, New Jersey. We had people coming in from like Brooklyn and other places in, in New York and Connecticut. Um, we decided to launch a dot com and then we sort of noticed like word of mouth was like really picking up and people were buying products and uh, sort of sharing um, with their friends. Um, and we sort of organically kind of built this loyal base of customers online um, and just the sheer comments, you know, from customers about how they feel after using the product or what it's been able to do for them um, is when I really noticed that we had an opportunity here. And again, that was about a year after we launched the product. When you went online, how long did it take for you to get traction with like cold traffic, right? People who hadn't heard about you from, from word of mouth. Yeah. So I, here's what I'd like to say. We, I literally started this business with about $500. (laughs) in my pocket. Like I had about, I had a good job, but I also had responsibilities. I had a, I had a, I had another business uh, that was eating up large sums of cash. I had a mortgage, I had responsibility. Um, So I really started this business with about $500 from the kitchen of my home. And so, uh, you know, starting the business out honestly was a word of mouth play for us. And then we, we just doubled down. So we reinvest the money that we had earned from the folks that were coming into the barbershop to purchase the product. Uh, and then we try something else. And so I remember in those days, uh, reaching out to folks on Instagram that had really good following, looked like they had like really great, uh, hair or beard. And I'd be in their DMs. <laughs> Asking them if they were interested in trying our product. At that time, I don't believe that it was called influencer marketing. You know, we were just reaching out to random folks. And at that time, you didn't have to pay anybody. You could just give people product, ship product to their home and ask them for a review and exchange and people were doing it. So I found myself, you know, at some point, you sort of the height of it, you know, shipping out about 100 packages a week to folks that have responded and said that they're interested in, you know, trying our products out and they agree to review the product. So from the barbershop to what's now called influencer marketing, gaining up enough, you know, enough revenue to then try out Facebook ads. At that time, I think we were able to spend like a dollar and see like seven or eight dollars in return on Facebook ads. It might have even been more that the good old days of, of, of Facebook. Yeah. Um, and so we just we just doubled down. We doubled down there. We seen seen some traction there, and then we just continued to to reinvest and double down and and build the business, and then try additional channels. So it definitely was more of a stair step, uh, crawl, walk, run approach. Sure. What would you looking at that? How you built it through you know, obviously influencer marketing, reaching out to people through Instagram. How, uh, if you were to do it over again right now, or like have to start another brand, yeah. what, what would you, after a lot of what you've learned in your experience, how would you approach it now today? Honestly, I'd probably still do some of the things that I did in the early days. And, you know, when I look back at it, you know, that, you know, me, the founder having direct contact with my, with, with potential consumers, reaching out, sort of getting feedback leveraging that feedback and it all goes back to the barbershop too right leveraging that feedback to make improvements on the product consistent improvements on the product is something that i would advise any uh new entrepreneur to do right yeah it's super critical it's so important to be close to the customer uh those insights are just invaluable so if i had to start another brand um I would probably do some of the same things that I did back then, really focusing on the consumer, having this intimate dialogue with the consumer. I'd probably also think about how I can build community, you know, in a deeper way. But those are some of the things that I'd start to think about as I'm as I'm building another brand. And and then the other thing is, is I probably would consider retail a little bit earlier. And when I say for if it if it is a consumer product. I would probably consider retail a little bit earlier. Now, I think what we've done in terms of, you know, building an audience and then being able to leverage that to have conversations with Target and Walmart, 
is sort of ideal. I just think we could have done it a little bit earlier. I feel, you know, a year earlier, a year and a half earlier than when we started probably would have put us in a much different space. Because as as some of us know that are in the space, men's grooming is becoming a, a really, really competitive market. There are new incumbents uh, coming in each and every day. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a pretty hot market right now. Um, you know, so, so as I think about retail and and saying, you know, I think we said as a team, you know, D to C is where it's at. And we didn't really want to consider retail. I probably would have considered it earlier because the reality is that still 80 to 85 percent of sales for men's grooming products and personal care and beauty still happen in retail doors. You know, so it's about being where the consumer is. Being where being where the consumer is and yep. just having a much larger pie Slice yes. of a charger pie. When you were scrapping on your way up and sending in sending DMs and trying to figure out how to make this thing happen, what are some of the best resources that have helped you uh, on your entrepreneurial journey? Phoning a friend, uh, not being uh, not being shy to sort of uh, reach out cold emails and u- utilizing LinkedIn. Um, to talk to a plethora of, of folks that have sort of been here, done that before. Those have been some of, I'd say, the most valuable resources. Um, also being just super inquisitive. I am a very avid podcast listener. I'm always reading, um, just always trying to educate myself. I'd say that too is, a, is, a, is an incredible resource. And I've been pretty fortunate enough to meet some incredible folks that are in my space that have, you know, shared past knowledge and past experiences with me and have, have made some wonderful rec- recommendations that have kind of shaped um, how I think about the business. And, uh, it, you know, so those have been some very, very uh, valuable resources. I'm going to put you on the spot here. What are some good podcast recommendations? <laughs> some of them, like the Tim Ferriss Show. Because I'm in the beauty grooming space, uh, the BOF, the business of fashion and, and glossy, masters of scale, how I built this is just one that I always listen to. How success happens, e-commerce influence. Um, <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a ton. So there's, nice. there's like this, like probably 15 or 20 that I listen to. Nice. I find myself going in and out of listening to a lot of podcasts, then not it's been cha- during the I used to listen to them quite often when I'd go to the gym mm-hmm. and uh, and then during quarantine and COVID I've fallen out of it and then I'm trying to get back into it and get some new it's a new fresh inspiration yeah. so I'd love to hear what you you talked about your curiosity what, what are you curious about right now one of the things that I am really super curious about or you know I've spent uh, a ton of time you know, thinking about is what are some of the difficulties that I had as as an entrepreneur starting out and how can I make it better for someone else that's sort of, you know, coming up, right? How do I reach down and pull someone else up, right? I, I just feel like I have an obligation to do that. And as an entrepreneur of color, I'd say a lot of it has had to do with sort of access uh, and opportunity. And so, you know, as I think about, you know, how we continue to build the business and what happens, what my life looks like after Scotch Quarter, you know, I think about the struggles that I faced as as an entrepreneur and I think about how I can provide or how I can be useful in providing access and opportunity um, to folks that may struggle the same way that I, uh, that I've struggled. Um, as an early entrepreneur. So some of that is when someone reaches out to me, I am always <laughs> usually available to, to hop on a call with an entrepreneur that's, that's trying to figure it out. Like, I love doing that. I feel like I have an obligation to do that because I've had wonderful people in my life that didn't have to do that. Um, and they did that for me. And it's been incredibly helpful. So I'm always looking to how can I provide you know advice or, or talk about you know some of the uh, you know, the pitfalls that I've faced and some of the, the mistakes that I've made, how can I sort of leverage that to help another young entrepreneur um, avoid some of those uh, pitfalls and mistakes? And then I also think about, you know, when uh, the time comes when, when I'm no longer uh, running Scotch Porter, you know, how am I going to use my dollars to help another entrepreneur that comes from a similar background as me and, and, and has, you know, 
really smart, intelligent, has wonderful ideas, but doesn't necessarily have the access or capital to really see his dreams flourish. And, and how can I play a part? Sure. I want to be respectful of your time and I'm going to wrap it up. I want to ask you one question, though, about bootstrapping. You talked about that being a big challenge at, at the beginning. Uh, it's one of the hardest things about building Scotch Porter. Yeah. What are some of the benefits or things that you learned from bootstrapping that you don't think you would have learned if you had been financed? Yeah, um, definitely the creativity um, and ingenuity that is required when you have very little to no money <laughs> sure. um, in your bank account. The things that you can come up with um, when you have no money is quite amazing. It just forces you to be super resourceful. It forces you to be creative in ways that you would have never imagined because it's almost like fighting for survival is, is how I always see it, right? Yeah. Versus having a cushy bank account that's padded, uh, you know, tons of money in the bank and you can kind of just spend $50,000 to test this new channel and $50,000 to test this new opportunity. When you bootstrap, you don't have that. You don't, that's not even possible, right? So it forces yeah. you to be really, really creative and think about each and every dollar that you spend and be super mindful and thoughtful about how you spend your money and where you spend it. And I think it just makes you a, a much stronger, uh, more empathetic uh, sort of leader, right? You know, when, when, when you've had to when you've had to fight uphill battles, when you've had to, how the hell am I going to make payroll? You know, when you've had to go through all of those things, um, I think it builds character. I think it just makes you a much stronger entrepreneur. Calvin, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for hopping on here and, uh, and, and chatting with me and answering some questions and just kind of sharing about your journey. If someone's listening and they're interested in learning more about you and Scotch Porter, what's your best resource to connect with you? Sure. Well, we are on Instagram and Facebook, Scotch Porter, scotchporter.com. You can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Calvin Qualis. I just recently started an Instagram page, uh, so you can find me there as well. <laughs> I think there's two ghosts. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 saw this, I, was, not I was looking for you. I was like, okay, okay. He's just starting. Yeah, I gotta it. do a far better job. <laughs> you got, you got, you're busy, man. You got. You yeah. Know. <laughs> or you can email me at calvin at scotchporter.com. Calvin, thanks so much. Um, you. you have a great, great rest of the day, and I'll ta I'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thanks a lot. All right, here we go. Well, it don't matter. Oh, you got money. Hey guys, it's Austin. And if you've been loving the podcast, you got to go check out brandgrowthexperts.com. That's where I work one on one with my clients to help them build faster growing, more profitable online stores. I've got coaching programs and workshops that we host all over the world. Would love to have you come check it out. If you're a fast growing e commerce business or you want to be a fast growing e commerce business, you got to check it out. That's the spot for you. We go more in depth than we do in the podcast with comprehensive trainings and coaching to help you scale up. Check it out, brandgrowthexperts.com. See you there.